I doubt that any of you listening to this video lecture haven't, at some point in time, rolled over on their ankle. Sprained ankles are probably the most common musculoskeletal injury, with 3 million cases reported per year and the countless mild cases that go unreported. So what is it about the ankle joint that makes it so susceptible to injury? This is one of the questions we will address in our discussion of the bones and joints of the foot. Good day, and welcome to this installment of the Anatomy Video Podcast Series. Today, we finish our journey through the lower limb with a look at the feet. Some dense material to study, but it's made easier by the fact that we've already studied the hand. The feet can really be thought of as a modified version of the hand. If we think of someone walking on all fours, you'll notice that the palmar surface of the hand makes contact with the ground, similar to the plantar surface of the feet. We're gonna to start today's lesson with a look at the bones of the foot, which will lead to a natural progression into the joints and ligaments that permit movements in the feet. This will also be a good time to discuss a variety of joint injuries in this region, with a particular focus on ankle sprains. Similar to the hand, we can divide the bones of the feet into posterior tarsal bones, which are analogous to the carpal bones, the metatarsal bones intermediately, which are analogous to the metacarpal bones, and the phalanges distally, which are analogous to the identically named bones of the hand. The talus is the most superior of the tarsal bones. It receives weight from the tibia and redistributes it through the other bones within the feet. It has no muscle or tendon attachment itself, but it does have a number of articulating surfaces. The talus can be described as having three regions. A posterior body articulates with the tibia and fibula superiorly and with the calcaneus inferiorly. A neck region separates the body from the head region, which projects anteriorly and inframedially to articulate with the navicular bone. The head is palpable as a hard, rounded mass on the medial aspect of the foot, just distal to the medial malleolus, in particular when the ankle is placed in eversion. Next, we have calcaneus, also known as the heel bone. This is the largest of the tarsal bones and arguably the strongest bone in the body. Now, this makes sense when you think about it. It accepts the entire weight of the body through the talus and distributes it into the ground, which means it's constantly subjected to the heaviest loads within the body. The superior surface of the anterior two-thirds articulate with the talus. This articulation includes a shelf of bone known as the sustentaculum tali, or literally the sustainer of the talus which supports the medial portion of the talus. And this creates a space inferior to the talus known as the tarsal tunnel. And we'll see in the next session that this space contains and protects a number of tendons and neurovascular structures that communicate between the leg and foot. Posteriorly, we find the calcaneal tuberosity for insertion of the Achilles tendon. Off the inferior surface of the tuberosity, the medial and lateral tubercles help in supporting the weight of the body, which also creates a groove for muscle and fascial attachment. Moving anteriorly, we see the navicular bone. It gets its name because of its boat-shaped appearance. It has a concave posterior surface that articulates with the head of the talus and a convex anterior surface which articulates with the three cuneiform bones. Medially, it has a very prominent tuberosity for muscle attachment that is also palpable on the medial aspect of the foot. Unlike the head of the talus, however, this bony landmark is palpable in both inversion and eversion. The lateral most of the tarsal bones is the cuboid. Once again, it has a prominent tubercle in the lateral aspect for muscle attachment. Distally, we see a groove which accommodates the fibularis longus tendon we discussed in the previous lesson. The distal medial row of tarsal bones is made up of the lateral, intermediate, and medial cuneiform bones. And cuneiform is a Latin term meaning wedge shape, which describes the appearance of these bones in the coronal plane. This keystone shape contributes to the transverse arch we'll be discussing towards the end of the next session. This once again provides some depth to the plantar surface to absorb ground reaction forces and prevent plantar structures from being crushed during weight bearing. Finally, we have the metatarsals and phalanges. Now, these bones are pretty similar to what was described in the hand, down to the two phalanges in the great toe and thumb, compared to the three on all other digits. So it's a bit redundant to describe them in depth here. The one feature we will touch upon is the base of the fifth metatarsal, which serves as an attachment point for the peroneus brevis muscle. 
Forceful contractions or inversion sprains can occasionally cause a fracture at the site of tendon attachment due to its pull. Now, this is known as an avulsion fracture, and in the case of the fifth metatarsal, creates point tenderness on the lateral aspect of the foot and reproducible pain with plantar flexion. Looking at some radiographic images, we see the tibia and fibula at the level of the ankle joint. Note that the fibula projects inferior relative to the tibia over the dome shape of the superior surface of the talus, forming the tibiotalar or ankle joint. Also note that the outline of the calcaneus projecting posteriorly, the navicular bone and the associated talonavicular joint, the medial cuneiform can be identified just distal to the navicular with the cuboid on the lateral side. Finally, note the prominent base of the fifth metatarsal, which serves as that site of muscle attachment. The ankle joint is a synovial hinge type joint between the tibia and fibula and talus. The weight-bearing portion comes to the shaft of the tibia directly into the superior surface of the talus. Note, however, that the surface area is greatly increased with contact between the talus and medial and lateral malleoli. The ankle joint is often described as a morti and tenon. That's a term used in architecture to describe a square peg, the tenon, embedded in a square slot, the morti. And this is something common seen in log cabin designs, for example. The ankle is a hinge joint which permits dorsi and plantar flexion. Note that as the joint moves between dorsi and plantar flexion, the superior surface of the talus glides in the sagittal plane, such that the anterior surface makes contact with the tibia and fibula and dorsi flexion, while the posterior surface makes contact in plantar flexion. This is significant because the talus is wider anteriorly than posteriorly, which means that in a dorsiflex position, it's this wider anterior portion wedged between the tibia and fibula, creating a tighter fit. In the plantar flex position, the narrower region of the talus articulates with the tibia, resulting in more wobble or joint play in this position. You can demonstrate this on yourself by using your hands to try and rotate the relaxed ankle in both a plantar flexed and dorsiflexed position more wiggle room in the plantar flexion, isn't there? The ankle joint is reinforced by collateral ligaments similar to what we see at the elbow. On the lateral aspect are three separate bands collectively referred to as the lateral collateral ligaments. The anterior talofibular ligament runs from the lateral malleolus to the anterolateral aspect of the talus. The calcaneofibular runs from the lateral malleolus inferiorly to attach to the calcaneus, and a posterior talofibular connects the talus and the fibula posteriorly to the lateral malleolus. On the medial aspect, we have a very broad medial collateral ligament, which is known as the deltoid ligament. Unlike the lateral collateral ligament, the deltoid ligament is one long continuous band the shape of a Greek letter delta. Despite this, we can still divide the deltoid ligament into four separate bands. The anterior tibiotalar ligament branches from the medial malleolus to insert on the talus. The tibionavicular projects down to attach to the navicular bone, and the tibiocalcaneal runs from the medial malleolus to the sesentaculum tali. Finally, the posterior tibiotalar runs from the medial malleolus to the posterior aspect of the talus. In addition to the ankle joint, there are a number of intricate joints associated with the foot itself. Similar to what we saw on the carpal bones, there is a subtle yet important movement that are associated with the intertarsal bones themselves. The majority of them permit very small gliding type motions that are limited by a number of strong ligaments. There are a few exceptions worth noting, however. The subtalar joint, this is an articulation between the inferior surface of the talus and the superior surface of the calcaneus. This joint can be further divided into two separate synovial articulations, separated by a region containing a thick ligament that binds the two bones together. The anatomical subtalar joint between the body of the talus and the calcaneus posteriorly, and the compound talonavicular calcaneal portion anteriorly. These joints function together in a predictable fashion. The inferior surface of the body of the talus is quite concave compared to the convex superior surface of the calcaneus. Now, this permits gliding between the two surfaces and a pivot of the subtalar region with the talus along a theoretical axis known as the axis of Hanke. This subtalar joint is what is principally responsible for the movements of inversion and eversion of the foot. Even though for simplicity's sake we normally speak of ankle inversion and eversion, 
If you consider inversion, an eversion of your own foot right now, you should notice that the plantar surface of your foot is drawn posteriorly as you invert. This oblique movement defines the axis of hanky. The transverse tarsal joint is another compound joint that includes the talonavicular joint in conjunction with the calcaneal cuboid joint, which tends to move as a functional unit rather than as individual joints. The transverse tarsal joint divides the foot into a midfoot and a hindfoot region and permits rotation within the coronal plane, which contributes further to inversion and eversion. Movement at the tarsal metatarsal joints is limited, but it does create a boundary to distinguish the midfoot from the forefoot region. There are a number of clinical correlations seen at the ankle. Now, our focus is going to be on ankle sprains because of their prevalence. Ankle sprains can be classified as inversion and eversion sprains. Inversion sprains are the most common type of sprain in the body, the result of hyperinversion, which ends up tearing the lateral collateral ligaments. They typically occur during running and jumping motions and usually involve a certain amount of plantar flexion. This is likely due to the increased joint play we see in the plantar flex position, making the ankle more susceptible to injury in this position. A coronal view of the ankle gives an appreciation for this instability. Here we see the tibia lying on top of the talus, which itself is lying on top of the calcaneus. This results in a direct transfer of weight from the tibia shaft down into the calcaneus. Note the narrow foundation seen here. Planting with a certain degree of inversion, therefore, pushes the force vector outside of the base of support of the calcaneus, creating a rotational torque along the axis of Hanke. This rotational force is normally resisted by the lateral collateral ligaments, but if the force exceeds the strain limit for the lateral collateral ligaments, tearing will result. This is the classic example of an inversion sprain. Varying degrees of inversion sprain depend on the severity of the injury. First, we have what's called a grade 1 sprain, involving micro-tearing within the anterior talofibular ligament and quite often in the calcaneofibular ligament as well. And this low-grade sprain results in a bit of pain and immediate swelling because of the microtrauma, but there's no joint instability. The individual is usually able to walk around without too much difficulty, but there's typically a point tenderness for a few days or a couple of weeks. Second-degree tears involve partial thickness tears within the anterior talofibular ligament and sometimes within the calcaneofibular ligament. In this case, there is some compromise to the actual ligament itself. It's not a complete rupture, but a large portion of the ligament has been completely torn. Now, this results in more severe pain and point tenderness. The individual would have significant difficulty walking on it immediately afterwards. But again, so long as the ligaments are partially intact, there should not be a traumatic loss of stability. In the third degree tear, we see complete tearing of the anterior talofibular ligament and sometimes the calcaneofibular ligament. The individual is not going to be weight-bearing, and there's going to be great joint instability. A standard test for a third-degree tear is what's called the anterior drawer, where the physician will stabilize the tibia and fibula, put his or her hand behind the calcaneus, and pull forward. In the case of a grade 3 tear, you will typically get subluxation of the ankle joint as the talus moves forward relative to the tibia and fibula. It's important to note that the anterior talofibular ligament is typically always affected in each of these injuries, where the calcaneofibular ligament may be affected to a lesser degree or not at all. The posterior talofibular ligament is not typically involved because of its strength and position. Eversion sprains are far less common than inversion because of the biomechanics of the injury and the inherent strength of the associated medial collateral ligament relative to the lateral collateral ligament. It typically results from excessive valgus stress, as with an individual falling on the ankle from the lateral aspect while it's planted. Again, because of the strength of the medial collateral ligament, it's not uncommon to see an avulsion fracture of the medial malleolus, which is commonly known as a POTS fracture. Finally, we have what's called an ankle syndesmosis injury, more commonly known as a high ankle sprain. It's a bit of a misnomer as the injury is to the tibiofibular joint, away from the ankle joint. The mechanism of injury is excessive rotational torque of the leg while the foot is firmly planted. As previously mentioned, the tibia and fibula are connected through some very strong anterior and posterior ligaments, known as the anterior and posterior inferior tibiofibular ligaments. 
The torsional movements described in the previous slide twist the talus inside of the more T structure of the tibiofibular space, which pushes the tibia and fibula apart. If the force is severe enough, these ligaments can tear, resulting in instability and a tendency for the tibia and fibula to separate during weight-bearing. Here we see hometown boy Rob Gronkowski being tackled during the AFC Championship game against the Baltimore Ravens. You'll notice that his ankle gets caught in the torsional movement. This resulted in a high ankle sprain. That's going to do it for the bones and joints of the foot. On the other side of the break, we'll look at the muscles and neurovascular structures in this region. See you then.